Welcome to our uh, another edition of our Additive Manufacturing Podcast uh, from the folks at CAD Dimensions. I'm Kevin Keefe. I'm going to be your host today. I'm here with Adam Fosnott and Ken Postel. They are Additive Manufacturing Solutions Specialists here at CAD Dimensions. And uh, we're going to cover a lot today, actually. We have a few different topics. We're going to go all over the world. We're going to go all over um, a few different industries and talk about how additive manufacturing is making an impact today. I want to start with an article that you guys shared with me relative to Mercedes-Benz and what they're doing with replacement parts. Replacement parts, really common um, end use for additive manufacturing. What is Mercedes-Benz doing um, with this? It's a metal SLS process, right? Right. And so uh, metal SLS or DMLS is direct metal laser sintering. Uh, so it's probably the most common metal 3D printing method out there today. Um, so it's a really industrial system. Um, typically, it's a, a big box of metal powder, essentially. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But the metal powder gets there by depositing layer after layer after layer. So... They'll spread okay. a thin layer of metal powder over your, your build area, and then a laser will go around and trace the cross sections. So the laser has the pattern, and then as the laser moves on the metal bed, it it centers yep. that, those filings. Is, is it filings or the powder? It's a powder. Okay. How do you metal get? How, how does metal become like a powder? How do you get it like powdered? There's a lot of fun ways you can do it. Yeah. Uh, usually it involves a plasma and a metal feed stock. And so the ways that I've seen it done is essentially uh, you have metal like a rod that gets pushed through a plasma, which instantly melts the metal. Those metal plasma, droplets. Uh, like a plasma cutter? Yeah. Like that's kind of what I'm Very thinking? Very similar to a plasma okay. cutter. Okay. All right. And so uh, the metal droplets uh, often go onto a really fast spinning disc, and that centrifugal force blasts the powder out to the edges where it can be harvested, and then you have a metal powder. That's really Real easy process. But, you know, because it sounds <laughs> a little complicated, actually. Uh, it sounds like you need a lot of things, including plasma, which I can't imagine is uh, easy to come by. So uh, It's surprisingly easy to come yeah? by. Yeah, okay. Um, you just need some high voltage and, you know, a shielding gas. Okay. Um, so typically any, like, arc welder could be converted to a plasma cutter or vice versa. Sure. Okay. Um, you could hack one together from some old microwaves. Um, I've definitely never done that. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to. If you really um, <laughs> want to hack, you know, a way to create fun, yeah. you could do it. And then yeah. uh, and then typically after you have your metal powder. We're not going to condone hacking, creating a, a plasma cutter. That's probably a bad idea. You could hurt yourself. Please uh, don't do that. Yeah. Um, typically after that, it would go through um, another process, again, with plasma to convert that metal powder into perfectly uniform spheres. Oh, okay. And so it's a multi-stage process to get a metal powder that is completely uniform in size and shape. So when you've got like metal powder and I'm hearing things like that and you're talking about a laser, I'm imagining a really complicated system to create right. this. So it sounds like this is technology that Mercedes and Daimler have been investing in for a long time. And they've obviously been involved in additive manufacturing yep. for decades, but um, one of the few auto manufacturers have been out ahead of that curve. But, um, you know, when it comes to you know, on mass replacement parts like that is, is, is a direct SLS going to be a really viable long-term solution for creating those metal parts? Is it, is it, is it that much, you know, faster and more affordable than other, you know, competitive stuff? Yeah, actually it is. Great. Um, I think, uh, with this story in particular, it comes down to volume. Mm -hmm. And so not only Mercedes, but I know there was another story for Whirlpool yep. where they're creating replacement parts on demand for a lot of their older equipment, equipment cars, sure. what, what have you. Um, and essentially, it's a, it's a matter of volume. And so if you, ha if you only need five replacement parts a year, keeping the tooling around to make those parts just doesn't make a lot of sense when you so, can print okay. them for a comparable cost. But I could see that for something like Mercedes, where, you know, especially if you have like an antique or something yeah. where, you know, the parts just aren't being made anymore. Whirlpool is a relatively generic household name. Are you making a lot more of those parts than you would for an old Mercedes? Maybe. I don't know. Well, because so I read, the, <laughs> I read the Whirlpool article tool because you're talking yeah. about now that's a plastic process. Right. Though, so right. those are plastic parts. It's going to be much and shorter. So those are going to be process. much cheaper. You can right. crank them out right. more quickly with sure. less post processing than with a metal DMLS process. Yeah. And so because of the differences in the technology, I think it's easier to justify the plastic. Parts. Sure, sure. I think one thing to stress with Mercedes Benz is this starts with their classic cars. Right. So this is really low volumes. Right. 
and you'll probably see this move slowly and slowly more towards like cars that might have been released 10 years ago trying to think of like from uh, the hangover when the tiger goes to town on the on the mercedes yeah. that they're driving <laughs> through like how you'd have to replace you know the piece the piece, handle yeah. that cranks up the window and all that kind of right stuff. and where would you find those parts where would you find it oh, mike tyson yeah. <laughs> so what other industries uh, could really kind of benefit from this? Have you guys given any thoughts to like, you know, um, what other industries are ripe for issues with replacement parts um, where additive manufacturing can really be a benefit that, you know, aren't necessarily picking up what Whirlpool and um, Daimler are doing? Yeah, I think I think any industry that's been around for a long time. What about craftsmen? With Sears going away and the Craftsman yeah. brand, brand being, I think, is bought by Home Depot now. Okay. Um, you know, so no you idea. probably got to deal with a lot of <laughs> legacy parts that go along with that. You know, Craftsman had the lifetime warranty forever yeah, and yeah. not so much anymore. Um, I'd have to imagine that that's, you know, going to be a, mark another change in that direction, too. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good point. I mm-hmm. think any business that's been around for you know, 60 years, less than that, 50, 60 years, if you've been around for that long, you probably have products that your customers still expect to be supported, especially mm-hmm. if you have a lifetime guarantee, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that it's really expensive to make those one-off, really old parts yeah. to, to replace them. Yeah. And 3D printing can, can be a way to do that more cost-effectively. Mm-hmm. Not only the cost of making it, but you have thousands of these just sitting in warehouses. Right. They, ju- they just sit around until somebody needs until it. Until there's a demand for it. Yeah, because when you make them with traditional manufacturing methods, typically you have to make them in batches. And then so if you can do it on demand, oh, and I'm hitting the microphone, look at that. And, and when you do it on demand, you've got, you know, you can actually have just-in-time inventory for the one, legacy stuff do... in those short-run projects, yep. freeing up warehouse space, mm-hmm. dead old tools, worried about replacing those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Um, solves a lot of problems from what it sounds like. Yeah, things like just-in-time production or single-piece flow are the types of uh, buzzwords and terms that get people in manufacturing really excited, right. but it's just not possible at scale, right. at least at this point in time. Right. Mm-hmm. And so this is a really good example of some of those ideas really coming into play. Matter of time, though, I'm thinking of um, you know the machine that Stratasys had at Rapid uh, last year, the, mm-hmm. the large scale... Oh, I forget the replicator, right? Where okay. it was uh, several shelves. It made just you know like little cogs or something like yeah. that, but it was you know a thousand of them an hour that it was producing because it was you know on such a big scale. Yeah, and that's a that's a machine that I believe is available even now and has right. a handful of customers uh, today. Uh, but even on the metal side of things, people are more and more focusing on the production aspects of three D printing, including Stratasys sure. with their new uh, LPM machine that's supposed to be coming out. Uh, I think, to Alpha or Beta customers next year. Okay, we'll talk about that in another episode because I want to talk about (laughs) a few other things. Um, So speaking of Stratasys and some different changes that they've had, um, I wanted to talk about an article that you guys shared relative to, it was about Stratasys has a new material um, that gives them certain access to a medical community that was prior had to go through hurdles to use a specific material. I'm not entirely certain. Um, what, what What was it about? Not material. It wasn't a material? Not material, no. Okay. Um, It's actually a software uh, license. So there's a third-party company called Materialize. Uh, they specialize in additive manufacturing software. Up until this point, it's been vastly focused on metal printing. Um, more recently, they've used what's called Mimics, which is one of their flagship products. That their that Materialize their proprietary software. Yeah, is, is called okay. Mimics. Mimics yeah. Sure. So it recently became FDA approved for making uh, an anatomically correct models. The software was approved. Yes. Okay, so why does the software need to be approved? Like, in my mind, if it's something is FDA approved as a consumer, that's like my medication or, you know, what my doctor is telling me, a procedure. How, why does the software need to be FDA approved? I don't have the exact reason for that. Okay. Um, my best guess was... Uh, You're not the FDA? No, I'm surprised <laughs> I'm not. My best guess as to why it would need to be FD, FDA approved is just um, basically an assurance of accuracy. Okay. So anything that's going to go in a human body. Maybe not permanently, but I think when we look. So, for example, the article talked about how Stratasys was approved. Mm-hmm. Now, what real? What does that really mean? Is Materialize got the FDA approval, and then Stratasys released some of their machines to be allowed to be processing files through Materialize's software. Typically, okay. Stratasys machines are using their own software packages. So what? What the Mimics is doing is it's allowing Stratasys machines to print verified models. Okay. Dimensionally so the, or... 
does it eliminate a step when you're in going through that process uh, of creating an anatomical model or a surgical guide? Is, is it a faster process for the end user or is it, you know, taking a headache out? Yeah, I think today, right now, I do not think Stratasys um, has a pathway for surgical guides that actually go in the body. Mm -hmm. um, I know we, we do a lot of um, pre-surgical planning models and stuff like that and even practice yeah, models. sure. Those don't obviously don't have to have the same requirements. The preoperative models, yeah. um, I've seen a lot of those where the, you can get really anatomically mm -hmm. correct uh, the to feel, scale the look, and yeah. accuracy mm -hmm. that incredibly lifelike <clears throat> where it's a pre-surgical model that a doctor can operate. When you think about you know, how many opportunities a surgeon has to practice, you, know, you have cadavers, you have mm -hmm. medical school, and then you have real life practice. But if you can you know, create an anatomical replica that responds and reacts and looks the same as a, a piece of human tissue and an organ, mm -hmm. it's going to give that doctor a whole better understanding of what's going on inside that person's body when yeah. they have to go perform an operation. So really, this, this FDA approval on Mimics is kind of the next step towards using it inpatient, Got it. in surgery. So up until now, I think the only thing I've ever seen is people using the models in, surgically as a ref in surgery as a reference. Sure. So, like I said, there's really, there's no FDA-approved thing to go, like, put something in surgical as a drill guide and then take it out. There's definitely nothing you could leave it. <laughs> I, I hope not. No, um, not you yet. You know, maybe, you know. That what? is, that I, is I, being. I was going to say, yeah, plastic implants and things like that. Is that, metal is that hip not far away? Metal hip replacements are already 3D printed. Yeah. They're already mm -hmm. being approved. Um, I think it's a very um, time-consuming process because they have to be kind of individually approved. So I think that's oh, for like by the, by the person? Um, is that what you mean? Or? I don't know the exact process, but I do okay. know that every printed component will have to be approved. Sure. Because if you think about it the other way, whoever's producing the hip, hip components now, hip replacement parts, they have to be cleared. Their original master right. die has to be cleared. Right, right, right. So if you're doing one-offs every You've time... You've got to hold the, an additive process to the same standard as you yep. would anyway. Mm -hmm. else. I get that. That makes sense. So this is kind of just the next step to getting us closer to eventually that mm -hmm. the end goal of possibly having implants very cool no i mean i think when you hear people talk about additive manufacturing in a medical space you hear you know people talking about oh you can print organs and you can print you know ears and things like that you get a lot of science fiction but yeah. when you really look at what are real practical applications there's a lot more than science fiction there's a lot more based in science in mm -hmm. practicality um so speaking of, of of health and science uh this was an interesting one because you guys were talking about all right, I, I get where this is going. You were t it was okay. an article about air quality. And I only want to touch on it because I wonder if it's just people picking a fight. Because from the best of my understanding, I, the way I kind of equated it was you have plastic that is melting. Mm -hmm. Same thing as if you held a you know grocery bag under a cigarette lighter at home and plastic melts I don't know in why the you air. You wouldn't do that, but yeah. You wouldn't yeah, do that, similar. hopefully. <laughs> um, but if you were to do the same thing, you're burning plastic, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's uh, uh, floral carbons or whatever gets released sure. into the atmosphere, bad stuff. Um, and people are basically saying there is a, a study that says there's you know relative science to the melting of plastic in the FDM process specifically mm -hmm. that has a similar effect. What, what is that all about? Right. And so this article is coming off of a two-year study of particles given off by 3D printers. All 3D printers, all FDM 3D printers. Um, naturally, I'm biased as someone who loves 3D printing, mm -hmm. whereas I definitely think they're just kind of picking a fight and blowing it way out of proportion. Sure. And so what this study focused on was they claimed that 3D printers, when plastic melts, creates nanoparticles in the air. What is a nanoparticle? <laughs> well, uh, th that, like, gets a, I, that gets fuzzy really quickly. I don't know that I've heard of a in, nanoparticle In every of article this. that I read. Okay. But apparently these scary nanoparticles are so small that they can run right through a surgical mask, they can run right through a HEPA filter, and allegedly they can actually embed themselves in your throat where they stay forever. Now, this all sounds absolutely terrifying, <laughs> but if you read kind of like the fine print of every one of these articles, it's inconclusive on whether or not it's harmful. Yeah, We know the particles are present, we know that... Some of them, depending on the material, could be harmful. Can, can we but even step not, back? It's not conclusive. Can we step back and say that in a 3D printing environment, like we're, mm -hmm. we're sitting in a 3D printing yeah. office space, right, where there are printers running, mm -hmm. 
I feel no great danger. But right. Then again, a nanoparticle isn't going to tickle as it goes down my throat. So <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say that um, it just kind of sounds like, again, picking a fight was probably the best way to put mm-hmm. it. Like there's, there's no real... Yeah, you got to question the science behind it yeah. a little bit. I wouldn't say that I'm completely writing it off. Like they can, I want them to continue doing the study, like continue long-term effects. But as of right now, I'm not, I'm not concerned. I'm not changing, I'm not changing anything about the printer well, at home. You know, I'm it'd not, be I'm not to see, like, stay so out of this room. As a comparison, <laughs> what is the nanoparticle parts per million, you know, air quality level? In this room yeah. versus that room. Yeah. You know what I mean? Is there a yeah. change there? Is it an allowable amount? Because there are bad things in the air anyways. Right. You know right. what I mean? And everything is in an allowable amount. There's an allowable amount of lead and mm-hmm. other things and arsenic and stuff like that. And you're yeah. drinking water, for God's <laughs> sakes. But it's an allowable amount because right. it's not deemed harmful. Kind of like what you said in the study. They don't really know if the nanoparticles are bad. Right. So that'd be the first question. Are, are nanoparticles yeah. bad for you? You're not is, vaping nanoparticles. You know, <laughs> is or, there, you is know? there a long-term health risk with that? And then if there is, then we can go back and look at the printers and say, hey, what's the difference yeah. between being in a room right. with one and not? Right. That it just sounds like they're trying to cast a pretty ominous shadow <clears throat> by saying there's this indestructible material that mm-hmm. will live in your body forever that only exists as a result well, of this one process. The way the news picked it up, yes, it was the end of the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they can, That's why, I guess, for us, we kind of looked at it and just went, ay ay ay. Well, you can paint a pretty bleak picture yeah. if you wanted to, and I'm sure there's probably one way to look at it like that, and, but it's probably not the, the most realistic way. Yeah, and, you know, I might sound crazy here, but the media immediately goes to, what about all the 3D printers in our schools? Yeah. Is this killing sure. our children? Oh, goodness, These yeah. things aren't enclosed. Is there proper yeah. ventilation? And the reality is, I don't know, if you're sitting behind a truck in traffic, it yeah. sure seems more noticeable to me <laughs> yeah. than the nanoparticles it's, from my 3D printers. Pile of black smoke in your um, face. I mean, like in Good college, point. I had two 3D printers printing all the time in my bedroom, like literal feet from where I was sleeping, for over a year. And I feel fine. I never noticed anything. Never smelled Didn't anything. Come down with a black lung. I mean, well, yeah, we'll, we'll I guess you maybe in, in yeah. maybe, <laughs> maybe in twenty years, you know, I'll, I'll have respiratory issues, and clearly it'll only be because of my three D printers and nothing else. I I think that that science <laughs> in the will world be today. inconclusive for quite a while. I yeah. think it would be really tough to say that's a direct cause and effect relationship right. that you can prove. The only comment I'd like to make on the the school one that always makes me laugh is. They demand HEPA filters. Like, that's what they want on all the printers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we just said, they don't catch nanoparticles. They're so small, they go <laughs> through HEPA filters. That's just, they don't do that anymore. So, and I'm going to assume, like, <laughs> to back up the science a little bit, I'm going to assume a nanoparticle is just something that happens as a process of any plastic that would be burning, right? Because yeah, yes. that was what I was trying to get mm-hmm. at before. The one I was thinking about this earlier, I would be interested to study the nanoparticles created by burning a candle. Okay. Because something tells me wax. you've got that paper, you, wax, yeah. or uh, you have a cotton wick, filament. You have a hydrocarbon, wax, just like plastics, a hydrocarbon, actually burning. Right. And something <laughs> tells me nobody's about to, to demonize candles and outlaw them from homes mm-hmm. over some nanoparticles that you know people have been using for years and years and years. You know, we'll have to look back at this in 10 years and see where the science is at. Yeah, and, uh, yeah I guess so. We'll have to do our own little health <laughs> yeah. checks. Yeah. So the last story that we wanted to talk about today was from Germany in Frankfurt, where there was Form Next uh, trade show in Germany. Um, I'm not gonna lie; I read this whole article and I stopped at the words "liquid vulcanization." Okay. Please tell me <laughs> what this is about, because like in my head, I'm six years old, and liquid vulcanization sounds like the coolest thing I could possibly right. do to a bad guy. <laughs> so, what is that all about? Or it's something out of Star Trek. Right? Yes, I, yes. I just think Vulcan, but um, anyway. Uh, so liquid vulcanization is essentially a chemical reaction. Okay. That doesn't sound nearly as good. No, no. <laughs> well, uh, can know, we call anyway. everything liquid vulcanization? <laughs> I wish we could. Because, oh, maybe, isn't that what, uh, you know, vinegar and baking soda, liquid vulcanization? Yeah, no, no. no, no. Uh, but liquid vulcanization is essentially uh, you heat a liquid and it vulcanizes into a rubber type substance. Okay. So it's a chemical reaction. Um, and so what German RepRap did was they leveraged this chemical reaction to create a 3D printer that prints in a liquid and then it vulcanizes into a medical grade silicone. Interesting. Okay, because yeah. silicone being entirely solid, that's, I mean... Solid, but also 
strictly malleable. flexible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so okay. So I'm assuming silicon is or silicone, silicon, silicone, silicone. Big difference. Let's get those right. Different things. Uh, so silicone <laughs> previously unable to print in silicone, right? Outside of a lab, no, you can't yeah. print. So now this silicone. is commercially but available this is, technology. This is a real product that's okay. available, um, and it's significant in a couple different ways. And so I think it's significant because this is a company creating a 3D printer specifically for one niche. One application, It prints right. in one material, only one grade of silicone. It's just like some specific DuPont silicone. System. Okay. Um, so it only prints in one material, and it's only targeting medical industries. And it, it does one thing, and it... I, Hope it so, does it well. <laughs> so is the, I was going to say, is the assumption that there's enough, you know, industry yeah. around the silicone 3D printed part, you know, demand for yeah. this type of business to exist and sustain itself? I think so. I think uh, 3D printing in medical contact, a lot like we were talking about before with, yeah. with mimics, mm -hmm. um, isn't used a lot. Anything that needs to be food safe or needs to be... Uh, contacting the body for long periods of time usually can't be 3D printed. You know, we were talking about that. Space. We were talking about that because in the office we have that little cube of uh, measuring cup, and yes, uh, yes. we were saying, "Oh, I, I'd love to, you know, give gift this at, at the holidays. Can I print like a bunch of these mm -hmm. and you know put them in stockings?" And we don't have, you know, a, 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 well, I don't think we have right a, a, a food grade plastic right. available to print right. in our you know office. We do. Well, we could. So right. Stratasys has a couple materials that are food contact safe. Right. However, 3D printing typically has layer lines. And all those little nooks and crannies, to make myself sound like I'm 90, um, collects little bits of food, which immediately kind of makes it not food safe because it can mold. Right. Okay. The, so, trick, the trick isn't that the material is not food safe, it's the cleaning. It's if hard. you had an yes. annealed product, though, where those lines and that gap was non-existent, would that probably eradicate that issue, maybe? But then again, what a process. Maybe, maybe. It, you... it would be the, the process. And yeah. then, again, every time it needs to be food contact approved, every process that you add to it increases the complexity, increases the number of certifications you have sure, to have. Sure, sure. So uh, it's difficult. Makes, to say yeah, more risk exposure, for yeah. sure. Interesting. Well, do you think that there is going to be more of an appetite in the industry for more really unique and, uh, and niche applications yes. just like this, like silicone? Like I know that there mm -hmm. are 3D printers in ceramic and other materials mm -hmm. that are really niche too. Um, is that going to kind of be continue to be a vertical for the technology? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was actually one of the things that Todd Grimm talked about um, at AMUG when we went earlier this mm -hmm. year, is that the, the niche targeting is going to just increase mm -hmm. as time goes on. You know, businesses will want to find, you know, the specific uh, segments that they want to serve, that they can serve, and that they can do better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, FDM has been around for a long time. And so essentially this is very similar to FDM, but targeted at a niche. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to think how when you watch the product life cycle of something grow, like that and 3D mm -hmm. printing had this big boom several years ago and yeah. a lot of consumer buzz and then now it's finding much more of a mature marketplace and manufacturing and yes. things like that. And then now instead of, you know, seeing a lot of that reaction on the consumer end and prices going mm -hmm. down and everybody buying them for their home use, it's more like, well, let's find out what the technology can do yeah. and keep exploring, which is great for the industry because it means that they're going to keep pushing the envelope. And people are using them for practical things right you right. know the 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 buzz and the excitement has this kind of shifted from i can have this at home and make bookmarks for myself or yodas or pokemon or what have you <laughs> and has turned to all manner of things how can we use this technology to really benefit yeah businesses and industry right. look look at stratasys look right. at the materials they've gone from their last generation of printers were what vast majority primarily just abs yeah and now that guy over there is doing all tem pack sure uh, nylon 12 carbon fiber like these are not as niche as the silicone mm -hmm. but they're still much more targeted than general abs materials, absolutely and, right? and you know i think yeah it's obviously we've seen a lot of cool new material we've mm -hmm. done videos on mm -hmm. video by the way if you haven't seen the videos uh <laughs> we beat the hell out of a new material called tpu it's an elastomer material it's really cool you can check that out too uh we'll have more videos coming out soon beating up other material but um <laughs> absolutely i think the future of the industry and the science is in the material research because mm -hmm. when you look at just the, what the material can really do, the technology is, 
outside of this, you know, rep, German rep rep that you were talking about, sure. where they're, you know, genuinely bringing a different technology and a different process to the market. The technology is going to be there. The material is really where there's just exponential opportunities. Right, right. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, 3D printing is kind of limited by the material that you're using. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there are some, you know, depending on your application, one material is always going to be better than another. And so the more we have to choose from, kind of the more the industry can you better, know, help other people. Better than mm -hmm. fit. Sure. All right, that's going to wrap it up for us, guys. I appreciate you guys uh, volunteering your time today for of this. Of course. You guys are brilliant. <laughs> I really appreciate your insight. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, be sure to stick around. We're going to have a lot more uh, links in the description. We're going to have resources. We're going to talk about all the articles, links to those in the description that we talked about today. And uh, more episodes on additive manufacturing will be coming your way soon. Look for those from CAD Dimensions. Thanks for watching. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>